Hi everyone! Welcome back to the second episode of Project SWA. I have been loving the comments and feedback. The artwork that you created with your beard and piece was amazing. I am so excited to see that everyone has been engaged, having fun, and learning. So today's episode is all about P.A. Mondrian and the distigial or neoplasticism movement. Whew, that's a mouthful. So when we think about distigial, most of us probably don't know what that means. It is Dutch for the style. So P.A. Mondrian was working right around the end of World War I and Europe was kind of a mess. And there was a lot of utopian idealism moving through the continent. People were really looking for an answer. They weren't really quite sure where to turn, what this new world looked like. All they knew was that they had been through a really difficult time and never wanted to go back there ever again. So the decisional mo movement really focused on creating balance, finding harmony, and finding these things already in our world instead of creating a new world, finding it within what we already knew. And believe it or not, this is what they came up with. So Pierre Mondrian was famous for these black, white, and primary color compositions. He used vertical and horizontal lines, very he was very, very orderly with his artwork. You're not going to see a whole lot of organic or round shapes there. And it was really interesting because he actually started off with the Impressionist movement, but the war changed a lot of things with um, how artists really perceive their own artwork. So this style was so different than what a lot of people had ever seen before. Just like Bearden, he kind of turned the art world on its head. So the people that were working together in this distigial movement with him, eventually it moved into what Mondrian considered neoplasticism. And plasticism, we think of manufactured. Um, we know what plastics are, but it was really a call again for balance and just harmony between the individual as well as the universe. And it's really interesting. You'll have to check out the links that I have added to the further study section because there's a great video which outlines how this artwork fits in these beautiful nature paintings, you know, when we think of the Impressionist movement. So it's really kind of nuts to see how that grid, those boxes, those lines, those vertical and horizontals fits. It was really impressive. So anyway, on to today's project. We are going to be making our own version of Mondrian, but we are going to focus on the letter of our first name. So for today's project, you are going to need paper, you're going to need a pencil, um, either a marker or a crayon, you're going to need paint, you're also going to need a rag or paper towels, a paintbrush, and a cup to wash your brush with water. Hi everybody, so you can see these are the materials that I have. I have just a another piece of plain white paper. You can choose a different color if you have it. Black works really well. You could go for one of the primary colors. I also have some paint here. I'm only using the primary colors. So I have yellow, blue, red, and then I have black in the middle. If I was using black paper, then I would choose white paint instead of the black. Or honestly, if you're gonna choose any of these primary color papers, just omit that color paint and replace it with either the black or the white. Um, so I have my paint and I'm just using this paper plate because when I'm done, I can throw it out. If you have one of those cute little paint palettes with the round plastic cups, you can use that. If you have the lid to a yogurt container, you can use that too. Just use whatever you have on hand. Um, you can use tempera paint or acrylic. Acrylic is permanent, so be careful and <laughs> make sure you're protecting your work surface. Again, I have a work table, so I'm not going to put anything down. Typically I do, but I have a white desk calendar and I was worried that you wouldn't be able to see this paper here. So I'm just gonna work on the wood and just try to be tidy. I have a paintbrush and you can see it has a relatively small head, nothing giant. I also have an alternative one. This is the one that I used when we did our Romare beard and lesson, and I love this brush. I'm a big fan of the round brush, and it's not giant, but it will help 
me get into those little corners. I have a pencil and a black crayon and then of course a ruler. So as we were talking about earlier, Mondrian was all about graphic style and he used almost all right angles Lots of lines, vertical and horizontal, squares, rectangles, and again, very orderly, neat, and tidy. So this is going to be a really interesting project for some of the younger children because using a ruler sometimes can be a little bit of a challenge. And then lastly, I have my water and then I'm using a rag to clean my brush. If you don't have a rag dedicated, you can use paper towels. Totally up to you. Use whatever you have. So I'm just gonna roll my sleeves up a little bit so that they don't get dirty. And we're gonna start. So in most Mondrian artwork, it fills the entire space. Usually there is a white or a neutral color background, sometimes gray, and then his lines go across and up and down. But I'm gonna do something a little differently today. I thought it'd be really interesting if we could incorporate the first initial of your child's name. So using your pencil, draw a very lazy outline of your kiddo's first name. So my name is Shannon. If your child's name is Charlie, he would draw a C. So again, fairly large outline of an S. And you can see it's pretty wide open because I'm going to need space around it to make this kind of a blocky letter. So I'm looking right here and I'm pretty close to the bottom and pretty close to the top. So I'm going to have to be pretty careful with what I do. Maybe I want to get a little funky with it. And instead of doing a standard block, I might bring it into here and then go on the inside at the top and try to connect here in the middle. That might be kind of fun. So we'll see where that takes us. Again, it's not too important to be super tidy with this. We're just trying to get an outline. Now, this is where it gets super fun. So have your child take a ruler and you can go straight for your crayon. I'm using a crayon instead of a marker. The only black markers I have are Sharpies um, and I am worried that they're gonna bleed through this paper. I also could use a watercolor marker, not a watercolor, a Crayola washable marker but I'm worried that if the paint comes in contact with it, it's gonna run all over the place. So once again, a crayon is your best bet. And I am just going to start to draw some random lines. So this is a nice vertical line. And again, nice and straight. If you have a kid that is having a hard time with a ruler, I always tell them, as far as your fingers will reach, put your finger on the four and the one on the eight, and then push down with all your might. So I'm going to absolutely avoid my letter. Moving across. You don't have to go all the way. You can make some half lines. So maybe I want to start here and I want to stop. That's fine. You can add a break. Now, Turn your paper and go the opposite way. So again, the lines don't have to go all the way. So this one, I'm just going to take across and then I'm going to stop. But now I have this break, so I have to figure out what to do with it. So maybe here I will take it back and then I can pick it up further down the paper. So you want a variety of lines. They can be far apart. They can be close together. It's really up to you. And that was kind of the great thing about Mondrian. And he really had a wide variety of what he wanted to do. Sometimes he would have lines that were drawn parallel to each other. So just like this, parallel versus perpendicular, crisscross. But they're really close together. And he'd have all these tiny squares. And sometimes he would have them really far apart or one section where they're really far apart and then one section where everything was really close. So he was really just very free with it. And it's interesting because when you look at his compositions, it works. 
it seems like there's no rhyme or rhythm, but he really believed in the balance of all of these things in nature and felt that regardless of how we drew these lines, we could find some peace within it. All right, so that kind of section that I left looked a little strange, so I actually went back and I filled that one part in. Um, but I really like what I did here with this narrow line. So I think I'm going to add a few more of these narrow lines down here and see how that, how that looks. Okay. So my, my crayon, because it's been rubbing up against my ruler has left some of these crumblies. If you were to wipe this with your hand, you'll get smudges. So I recommend that you just tap or you can blow it with air. Okay. So I'm, Feeling that that is pretty good. If you have older children, they might be interested in adding more lines, but for our purposes, we're gonna keep this pretty open. And you can see that I did not touch my S. Now I'm gonna go back with my crayon and I'm going to outline my letter. Just go over your pencil, nice and smooth. So again, we, we talked about this earlier. You can do different things with this. You do not have to do the first letter of your name if you have a shape that you really like. You can do that. So this looks really neat if you do a circle or a triangle. I would avoid a square considering everything on the page already is filled with squares. But again, try to choose something where the shape is in contrast. So I'm gonna start with the weakest colors, that being yellow, and then I'm gonna work my way darker. So to red, blue, and then lastly, black. The reason for that being is yellow is a really weak color. It's a beautiful, bright, lovely color, but it can be overwhelmed by other colors really easily. If I were to use blue and then not clean my brush very well and then try to use yellow, I would get green really fast on this page. So make sure you're washing your brush really well. So I'm gonna start with my yellow and coat the brush. If you get too much on there, you might wanna wipe some of the excess off. And depending on how many squares you chose, you are you don't wanna go crazy. I would say I might do four yellow squares. So I'm gonna start and I'm just going to paint my blocks. Being careful not to get into the crayon and I will tell you the really nice thing about using crayon is wax is hydrophobic, meaning it does not like water. So your paint usually will not bleed into the crayon because it's so waxy. So I wanna know, what is your favorite color? I have to say my favorite color is red, which is nice, nice and bold. So you can see as I go, I'm actually going to turn my page, makes it a lot easier. So I'm not dragging my hand through wet paint. Okay, so now I'm completed my yellow, but what I think so far looks pretty good. And I'm gonna wash my brush. So to do that, I wanna show you the best way to wash your brush. Take your cup, hold your cup with your hand, otherwise we're gonna have a lot of water spilling, and gently tap the brush on the bottom of your cup. And as you do this, swirl it around back and forth. Now we get to do my favorite dance move. Go ahead and wipe it off. Take your brush and wiggle it back and forth. And your elbows should flap like a chicken. The reason for doing that is when you do that, all of your bristles move back and forth like this and get the water out of this crimp so that everything gets out of here and it's not dripping or blending. I'm going to move my water to the side and bring my artwork back. 
Now I'm going to go to the red. Now red's a really strong color. Red is actually my favorite color. And if I add too much red, it's gonna be the first thing your eye's gonna see. So again, I'm gonna start with four squares and then I'll see where that goes. So taking your red, select a few random squares and start to fill in. Being careful not to go over the crayon. So Mondrian only used primary colors. And the reason for that was because he felt that primary colors, they're the start of everything in our color world. They're the most purest form of colors as we know it. So if you can reduce something to its most basic elements, that makes it the most balanced, most harmonious version of itself. Again, as you go around your page, make sure you are turning. Keep our fingers and our hands from dragging through that wet paint. So much easier. All right, so now working into the blue, find more squares and fill in. I'm really trying hard not to put my colors directly next to each other. That's just personal preference for me. But if you really like them next to each other, that's fine. Just be careful with those margins. You don't wanna cross over those lines. Don't want any paint to accidentally mix Remember, primary colors only. So again, Distigial art came from the Netherlands and it was at a time right after World War One, where Europe was kind of in shambles. People really weren't sure if life could go on like it had before and quite frankly what had just happened to them. Um, so this was a time where people really kind of looked at themselves, looked at the world around them and thought what can we do to live in harmony to make this better so that we make sure that this never happens again. And so the utopian idea, this style of balance in order and just really taking things in their most simplest form was what Distichel was really about. And this is the forefront of cubism. And we know cubism because of Pablo Picasso. He made cubism absolutely famous, really reducing things into cubes. I mean, fragmenting them. But the the people that started the decisional movement, they so deeply believed this, that this actually moved from artwork and went into architecture. And there's a really interesting movement where you get these really wild houses that are just filled with all these blocks and cubes stacked upon each other. And they look a lot like Legos, which is pretty incredible. All right, so you can see now I have done all of my primary colors. This blue square here is looking a little thin, so I'm gonna let that dry and then I might add another layer. But I'm ready to start the black. Black is the one area where I think 
you could do a lot and it could look really neat or you could do just a few squares. Ask yourself and ask your kiddos, do we want more white or do we want more black? If we want more white, we want to do less of the black paint because our lines are already black. If we want more black, then we can fill in a lot more of these squares. This is the one time I'm not going to try to spread my black out. I will put two blacks next to each other or leave two white squares and then add some more blacks in a row. It's completely up to you. So again, making sure your brush is nice and washed. Go ahead and move into your black and rotate that page as you go so you don't drag your hand through this wet paint. working carefully so I don't smudge and again black is the most powerful color that we have so we do need to be careful with it it can really overpower the yellow that I have right here and the red plus if you get it on the white there's no way we can hide that You can see this square right here was actually split by my letter. So I'm going to make sure that I fill in this little area up top. And you can see I actually forgot my red square. So it's a good thing that we're talking about this because this red square, I forgot this little corner right here. So I have to make sure I fill that in. See guys, even our teachers aren't perfect. We all make mistakes. But like I tell my kids, are there such a thing as a mistake in art? No way. You make it work. You figure it out. I'm curious to know what everyone has been up to during this time. I know that, you know, we're the first week in. There's been a lot of change. There's, it seems like, on the news, it changes by the hour. As soon as we have one thing that we hear is closing, there's another rule or recommendation for the government coming down that, oh, you know, either rescinds what we had thought before or, you know, adds another hurdle to jump over. So it's been kind of crazy for me. Um, I know that most of you are watching from home, but I have actually been working this week. And it's been really kind of an incredible bonding experience with my coworkers. We're all coming together during this really uncertain time and working together to not only make sure our organization is afloat and that we're able to serve our families when we reopen, but also just kind of check in with each other. Like, how are you doing? This is intense. We've been cleaning everything, floor to ceiling. And I, I don't know if you guys understand what it's like when you are an art teacher, you have multiples of everything. I don't have one or two pairs of scissors. I have 36. I don't have, you know, four or five glue sticks. I have 40. So it's wild to just go through and not only take stock of everything that I have, but really have to think what is the best way that I can clean all of this stuff so that my students are protected. And I will say I am proud to, to say that, you know, we, we work really hard to keep everything tidy and really organized. And my art instructor and myself, we do frequently go through and clean things. So it's not a huge overhaul, but it, it is time consuming. It's pretty, pretty wild. I, so I can't even imagine what it must be like in other industries. And everyone at the hospital or working, you know, first responders, emergency personnel, firefighters, police officers, even doctor's offices. It's such a wild time to be alive, you guys. 
This is something that's absolutely going to be in the history books. All right, so you can see I've got the black squares that are coming along and I'm just kind of rotating, going around. Right now, this will be my fourth, so I am doing significantly more black than I had for my colored squares. So I'm curious to see if anybody knows why the primary colors are called primary and why they're so important. I'll have to, have to quiz yourselves. I'll give you a couple minutes and then we'll, uh, I'll reveal the answer. Okay, so if you've ever done a, co a color wheel, you know you start with the primary colors, and then as you go around, you have the secondary colors, then you have tertiary colors, and it goes on and on and on. So primary is the beginning, it's first. These are our first colors. We cannot make these by themselves. You know, yellow is yellow. Yellow doesn't come from mixing other colors together. Yellow is yellow. Same with red and blue. So those three colors begin every other imaginable color in the world. And it's really amazing. And because you know you can't get orange without red and yellow. There's no way about it. You can't have green without blue and yellow. You can't have purple without red and blue. So those are our secondary forms. Our tertiary forms would be like red orange. So mixing red and yellow, and then a little bit more red. So you're still getting orange, but it's on the red side of orange. I've always found that to be such a cool part about primary colors. We really can't make any other color without. Now, some people might argue that with technology today, we have all these fantastic colors or that, you know, black and white are so necessary too. And I'm not discounting black and white. I think black and white are really important because they give us depth. They give us hues, all those shades. You know, we can say, oh, well, that's red. But what kind of red? Is it a burgundy? Is it a maroon? And black and white really help add those depths and those shades into these colors that we create. Same with blue. You know, you can't have navy without black and blue. You can't have sky blue without white and blue. So it's really kind of incredible how all of these colors and shades work together to really color our world. Make sure while you're painting, you're filling in the square entirely. You don't wanna leave any blank spots behind or it'll look unfinished, and not very tidy. And when Mondrian was painting his Squares were always completely filled. He didn't leave any white marks behind. It was fully saturated. The only white that should be on your page is what's left purposefully to be a white square or your letter. Okay, so I'm feeling pretty happy with the black that's on here. So what I'm actually gonna do now is I'm gonna wash my brush really well. And I want you to go back and identify what areas you might need to fix. I know I have a couple corners that I absolutely forgot to fill in. And if you don't have any areas that need tidying up, I would suggest choose your favorite color and do two more squares of your favorite color. So my favorite color is red. So I'm going to add two more squares of red. I'm going to fix this corner first. 
Now, when you do those two squares of red, they can be butted up right against anything else. So if you have an area where you don't have any separation between, that's fine. Just find an area and fill in two more squares of red. I'm going to choose this big square right in the middle. Careful not to forget this area down below. Now I'm noticing the angle for me to fill in these areas is feeling a little strange. So again, I'm gonna rotate my paper. Just makes it so much easier. I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm using my pinky right now as a kickstand. I've been doing a lot of labor lately, <laughs> cleaning our building and everything. So I'm pretty tired. My hands are feeling tired. Normally my hands are really steady, but this little trick really helps to keep my hands steady. I can still move and articulate my fingers and my brush really well and reach all these different places, but I'm not having to worry about shaking hands because I am tired. All right, let's see, and maybe one more square up here. And now I'm gonna wash my brush. It's especially important if you're using acrylic paint because acrylic paint dries to like basically plastic. And if the paint dries on your bristles, it will absolutely ruin your brush and it's really hard to get this clean. So anytime you're not using your brush, it's just a good policy and a good habit to just keep it in either the water jar or just to wash it entirely. I like to wash it entirely so I'm ready to go for whatever's next. So I'm feeling pretty good about this composition. I have nice areas of white, my letter stands out really well, and I'm thinking that this has a lot of really nice balance that Mondrian was talking about. There's a variety of shapes. I have these small rectangles here. I have these narrow ones that are longer. I have a long one here. I have these nice squares that are kind of wide. It's feeling really good and balanced, and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, if you wanted to keep working on it and add more, you could, but just be aware that you do want some white blocks. If you fill all of them in, then you're not gonna have the true Mondrian style. Very rarely was there an absence of white. And if you do your entire background with the colors, then your letter is gonna look so stark against this. And we kind of wanted to stand out, but we also kind of wanted to blend in. Oh, it's a good thing that I'm reviewing my work because look what I just saw. There we go. All right, again, washing my brush. So guys, that is it for today's lesson. Um, I really hope that you enjoyed working on this and I am looking forward to seeing your own artwork. Be sure to send it to me and I will see you next week. Have a good night.